Well, here we are. So I have 12 o'clock Eastern time. So we'll get started. So again, everybody, thanks for being here today. I uh, really appreciate all your time. Um, you know, this is our first webinar of 2021. So we're very excited uh, to be bringing this right here in February. Um, we have a great presenter here today, uh, John Schock, who I'll uh, introduce here in a second, but you can see his smiling face right there. Um, just a few housewarming slides here we'll go through and then we will um, start our recording um, and then John will be available to take uh, question answers and comments and then we'll take uh, questions live after the webinar but this is me you can see me here hopefully on your screen um, I'm an arborologist with uh, rainbow here I live in North Carolina but a fun fact for all of you Pennsylvanians out there um, I was actually born in New Jersey and grew up in Philadelphia and then uh, immigrated down here to the South years ago to stay warm. Um, and it's been, been great. But, um, you know, we work here at Rainbow just for things today. Um, one is if you have questions and answer, if you have questions, type them into the question and answer box here uh, in your control panel. Um, hopefully everybody is uh, maybe too familiar with that at this point. Um, this webinar is worth one ISA CEU. So if you did not enter your CEU information into the registration form, you can do that now into the, um, either the, the chat or the Q and a area. Um, and then this webinar will be recorded and a link will be sent out after the webinar. So with that, we will begin our recording. Again, we're here today, um, with John Shack of operations manager at good tree care. And if you give me just one moment, what I will do is I will bring up our recording and we will make sure that everything goes nice and smoothly here. So I'm gonna share that. And so again, um, we're gonna have our recording here in just a second. Um, and you can type in your questions and action answers as the recording is going. And with that, uh, we'll see how this goes. We'll talk to you all soon. Doc, uh, who is the operation manager at Goods Tree and Lawn Care Incorporated. Uh, John is an ISA board certified master op arborist and operations manager with Goods Tree and Lawn Care based in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. John's been involved with spotted lanternfly mitigation efforts since 2017, uh, contracting with the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture uh, the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, as well as working with commercial and residential customers throughout our region. And so John is going to share his experience with us today on spot and lantern fly mitigation, a contractor's perspective. John, if you would take it away. Thanks, Patrick. Um, thanks for uh, having me uh, participate in this uh, webinar. We've uh, really been uh, on the front lines with this new uh, problem that we face with spotted lanternfly. So it's been really exciting and, uh, and glad to uh, share our experiences as uh, we've been confronting it. There we go. Uh, so as Patrick said, you know, I've been in the uh, in arboriculture for uh, over 25 years and uh, currently serving as an operations manager at Goods Train Lawn Care. Uh, I was in sales for over 10 years before that and as a production arborist uh, before that. Our company, <clears throat> Goods Train Lawn Care, based in uh, South Central Pennsylvania, Bob Good started the company back in uh, 95. And in um, 2004, we became accredited with the with the Tree Care Industry Association and have maintained that accreditation since. We have uh, three primary divisions. Uh, we have plant health care uh, and as well as um, general tree care, we call it, uh, pruning and removal services. And in the last several years, we uh, opened up a turf division. So we had been goods tree care for a number of years and now we are, of course, goods tree and lawn care. Having all three of these services has allowed us, <clears throat> put us in a perfect opportunity to, to uh, become available as a contractor for this new threat we face in the spotted lanternfly. Uh, and we'll see that as, as uh, the presentation unfolds. Uh, so <clears throat> the spotted lanternfly, 
many of you probably uh, in, in other areas of the country have probably heard heard about it, but it's it's definitely still more of a regional uh, concern. Uh, the spotted lanternfly is, of course, an invasive exotic insect. It's a it's a leafhopper. Um, <clears throat> very very interesting looking uh, in all three phases of its uh, um, life cycle. So on the left we have a, the, the, one of the earlier instars, the black with white spots, and then in the center you can see it a little bit there. It's, it becomes a little larger with red with the modeling of black and white spots, and then of course on the the right is uh, the the, uh, the adult form uh, and a rather large insect pest. In 2014, uh, this pest was imported into the country uh, on uh, stone material. So I believe it was for you know, like countertops. Um, it was imported from Korea. And it, it didn't get a lot of attention. <clears throat> uh, so there was in the southeast corner of our state uh, in Berks County, we are over in Harrisburg. So this is uh, you know less than 100 miles away. And it was sort of uh, one of those things uh, that uh, I would I would hear about. So I have a good relationship with our uh, Penn State Extension agent, uh, and I encourage everybody else who has the opportunity to live in a state with a land grant uh, university system that has a um, an extension, an agricultural extension service. I think it's a great opportunity to uh, stay current with things that are going on and uh, to get help on um, uh, how, how treatments can be, be um, resolved for, di for different pests and disease issues. Uh, but so I was talking to, um, as I often did, and do uh, talking with our Penn State Extension agent, and he had been telling me, you know, certainly after 2014 about this issue down in Brooks County uh, that uh, was, was developing, but it was, didn't never really seem like anything that was going to come our way or be a concern for us. It was uh, what we've been told is that it was a tree. It was a pest that primarily infested uh, Alanthus trees, and, and you know we everybody of course would joke around like, oh well, that's it's about time something comes to knock that back because uh, who needs it, right? Uh, Alanthus also an invasive uh, um, tree in this case, uh, you know, was has been with us in in our area in. Um, came to North America, uh, um, I believe in the late 1700s, maybe 1800s as, a, as an ornamental, but uh, clearly escaped cultivation uh, long ago and it has become just a scourge. Um, <clears throat> it has a similar properties to that of walnut where it has the alle alleliopathic effect uh, and can um, prevent other uh, vegetation from growing amongst it. And so it becomes a, a quite uh, a competitive um, plant and, and can really invade uh, a lot of areas. It does, it also is very uh, adept at growing in spaces where a lot of other trees and shrubs wouldn't grow. So it has that going for it. So we see it in a lot of railroad corridors, along highways, all disturbed areas. But uh, so the, the concern didn't seem to, to, to I didn't bother me. It wasn't like, uh, you know, of course, with the ash trees, uh, with the ash borer uh, and some other issues that have come along. Um, but unfortunately, it, it, you know, we come to learn that it's just not Alanthus trees. It's uh, the um, USDA says that there's 70 host species that this can impact. Uh, and here's a list of, that was put out several years ago. And, and when you look at it, it's, it, it really encompasses uh, a, a range <clears throat> of species that, that are involved with agriculture from fruit trees, but also forestry uh, with oaks and our tulip poplars and um, pine uh, and then and then also uh, ornamental uh, landscape trees uh, maple sycamore willow and so obviously it caught the attention of uh, our uh, state uh, pennsylvania department of agriculture and they really had um, a, a, a uh, an interest in in getting a handle on this and stopping it from getting out of hand uh, and so in about, well, we started working with them as a contractor in 2018, uh, and uh, but I believe that at least 2017 and possibly there was they were working with uh, uh, contractors as early as 2016, but uh, certainly 2017 uh, they were looking to have us go out and destroy Alanthus trees, 
and um, and then treating a subset of these trees with a, an insect uh, systemic insecticide trunk spray. Uh, and so we started that work and we were working at that time down in Berks County, down sort of that ground zero area uh, doing doing this work. So um, like I said, so down in the first year, we were really working with a lot of uh, residential and commercial property owners uh, that had been dealing with this issue early on and, the, and the, the, the Department of Agriculture had let them know that you know, they were going to get us some assistance in dealing with this. So we were working with a lot of residential customers at the time. Uh, but then very quickly, we were realizing as this was beginning to spread, we needed to focus on areas that would further that spread. Um, so that would include distribution centers, um, uh, train in yards, railroad corridors where, where trains were moving slowly, parking lots of, um, you know, um, like say Walmart or home centers, um, because these this pest is a, a, a very adept at hitchhiking in all forms. So um, it lays its eggs on smooth surfaces. So, and that is how it came to this country, uh, laid its eggs on that smooth stone surface. It was, it was brought over and in the spring, the eggs hatched out and had a fertile ground uh, with a large supply of Alanthus trees to, to um, take hold in. Uh, so they travel that way, but they also are uh, will get on your person, uh, get in your car. You know, so here's a uh, an RV in the center picture uh, over a stand of Alanthus trees. So very easy to just jump down there and and uh, stow away. The, the RV goes off to somewhere else, and um, off it goes. Um, so that was the uh, the big focus. And so in that service, we did a several different. Um, methods here. So uh, the most economical for the state was to just girdle these trees through hack and squirt. So we're taking a hatchet and uh, <clears throat> girdling about 70% of the circumference of the stem. And we can do this up, you know, very small to, to very large trees. And then we're going to spray just with a hand bottle of um, a, a non-selective herbicide. And that material would go down into the root system and um, and destroy it. The problem with the lanthus is that they are prolific root sprouters. So if you were to cut one of these trees or just uh, just girdle it, uh, it it would send up ten new ones in its place. So uh, very important that that herbicide component is is part of this because uh, you know you might talk to homeowners about their experience with this. Yeah, I cut a, a large lanthus down and now now I have this forest. Uh, uh, and they're very fast growing trees. We also removed Alanthus trees when uh, if a condition, say we say we were to girdle it, leave it standing, if that tree were to become hazardous over time as it died, uh, they would uh, they would have these trees uh, removed. So this would be along parking lots and roadways, railroad corridors uh, and uh, over people's homes, things like that. And then the third way that we approached this was with, through foliar spray applications of herbicide to saplings. So it uh, wasn't often um, productive to go in and hack and squirt each one of these small stems where we could go in and do, do um, a concentrated herbicide uh, through backpack uh, sprays to, to knock that back, all with the intention of uh, knocking back its food supply. As I said, the other part of this was treating a subset. So on any property, say it could have a thousand lanthus trees, we would then, uh, the, the state would mark uh, with red tape or red paint a uh, several trees in, in strategic areas that would be, we would treat with uh, uh, rainbows trans tech trunk spray application. And, um, and that would then, we would concentrate the feeding on these, these few remaining trees. And then uh, the goal would be to kill uh, spotted lanternfly. And it, was, it has worked really well. Um, needless to say, uh, just because a tree is treated doesn't mean they're going to stop coming. And so these, these trap trees, over a matter of a couple of years, uh, became quite stressed from all of the feeding, the concentrated feeding. Uh, and we would see that these trap trees would, would expire after a couple of years. Uh, ambrosia beetles uh, were pretty common to, to come in and, uh, and finish these trees off. But it certainly did serve the purpose of killing bugs. And that was the goal. 
And so in this three year period that we've been doing this work with PDA, uh, we've, we've, we've killed a lot of Atlantis trees, as you can see there, probably over 35,000 trees uh, hacked and squirted. We've removed another 1,800 uh, physically, either uh, just leaving the brush or, or chipping it up. And uh, we've applied herbicide over many acres of ground and probably treated about 3,000 trap trees. The last couple of years, we've really focused our attention on uh, in our area in Harrisburg, there's a railroad corridor and so a lot of slow moving trains and a lot of Alanthus trees. So um, the goal was to really stop, prevent those uh, spotted lanternfly from getting onto uh, those trees that could then uh, move right onto the railroad cars. And so that here's a map of 2020 uh, from August that shows the current uh, state of affairs in Pennsylvania. Uh, the tan area in the southeast was sort of the earlier uh, quarantine area as of 2019. So you can see the spread, you know, continued to, to work outward. And then in 2020, uh, it sort of has continued to, to, to move to the west. There's uh, new infestation or newer infestations in the Pittsburgh area, in the western part of the state. Uh, and uh, you can see that this isn't just staying in the state of Pennsylvania. It's moved. Uh, to New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, uh, Virginia, West Virginia. And this, this map is from uh, uh, the state of New York. And you can see, uh, or maybe you can see that the red dots in the, those areas of New York where uh, pests were found, but infestations didn't take hold. So just because one adult lanternfly uh, travels, you know, jumps in a car and, and heads north, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that an infestation will take hold. If it's a gravid female, uh, one with eggs, that would be, you know, so it's sort of cer certain circumstances that are going to uh, make that happen. And of course, we had the, the fortune, call it good fortune, call it what you may, uh, to be sort of in the center of this uh, problem. And it's been a, a, a real opportunity for us uh, first working as a, a contractor for the state, which has been a, a very uh, good service for us. And, uh, but now we are also having to, to look uh, at helping our, our, our regular customers in our region uh, deal with this problem. One thing that we've just recently found out is that uh, research was done by Penn State that is showing that uh, the, it was always understood or there was a, a good understanding that the lanternfly had to get to the Atlantis tree and feed on it at some point in its life cycle to be able to complete its uh, life cycle and, and to, 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 to reproduce. Uh, this study has just shown that that's not necessarily the case, uh, although it's preferred, they tend to do better and uh, develop quicker with feeding on Atlantis. They don't need it. And so I think because of that, we're going to be seeing a shift in uh, uh, treatment protocols from the state. I don't represent the state, but I, my understanding is that probably we're, they'll be shifting their focus and doing less uh, this destruction of Atlantis trees and focusing more on the pests. So less herbicide, more insecticide. Uh, so taking advantage of opportunities, uh, we've since that since we started working for PDA, we also did work with the uh, and we continue to do work with the Department of Military and Veteran Affairs. Uh, we work, we go. Uh, there's a big National Guard base at uh, Indian Town Gap, and uh, this just above the Harrisburg area. Uh, so we've done a lot of work there, and as well as their armories throughout the state. Obviously, uh, the National Guard has a a lot of uh, land and they have a lot of equipment that has the potential to move uh, great distances. So uh, they, um, the, the federal government uh, and, and the state have coordinated to, you know, that's a priority so that they would not um, be spreading the spotted lantern fly. Other opportunities that we've seen, some we've taken advantage of, some we haven't. Conservation districts have put out bid proposals uh, for contractors as well as state parks. Uh, we've done work on corporate campuses. Come late season, these infestations become quite noticeable, and uh, we, we've been called out to do a sort of knockdown sprays with um, uh, contact insecticides. Colleges and universities, obviously, because of the potential spread, uh, students coming and going, you know, to and from college to, to, to their homes and other areas. 
Uh, HOAs, homeowners associations, tend to be um, have have developed concerns about this issue and uh, comes up at their meetings a lot. And uh, they 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 look upon us as experts to help them deal with this because there are some issues. And then of course, uh, just down to residential properties, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, like other world travelers and uh, serial killers, right? Invasive insect pests have personalities, and uh, it's important to, to. To I've thought a lot about how, how you know, we always think, you know, the the other one we've dealt with not you know, most recently is emerald ash borer, and many of you have uh, also experienced that. Um, and the interesting, you know, when we when we compare the two, you know, so the emerald ash borer really traveled and travels incognito. It, it didn't really, uh, very rarely would anybody even see it, right? And so, um, and very rarely did we actually know it was moved into our area before trees started showing up dead. So here's a picture, uh, rainbow uh, often has shown us uh, where you know, a tree line street of ash trees, uh, you know, a few years later uh, are dead and everybody's like, wow, what, what was that? You know, uh, it wasn't like you saw a thousand uh, spotted lanternfly adults flying around, you know, very rarely do you see any, um, but that you would just see this calling card. So we'd get called out to properties. Wow, what killed my tree? I don't understand it. And, and uh, you know, it was always uh, for us as arborists, we were always um, uh, surprised that uh, the general public isn't aware of of these large scale issues as, as we are, that we pay a lot of attention to it and to, to have to go over to a tree and say, oh, well, you see that little D-shaped exit hole. Well, that's that's where the adult emerged and you're peeling back bark and showing serpentine galleries. Uh, and so, um, and then then they start saying, oh, wow, that's, that's, so that's what that was, huh? Well, with spotted lanternfly, completely different personality. The impacts are also different, we'll talk about that. Uh, but uh, they aren't so subtle. This is like Mardi Gras, right? So they're, they're gregarious. They, they make a mess and uh, they don't know when to go home. Um, so, you know, one of the things they're, um, they're flowing feeders. So they, they, they pierce thin bark and, and suck out the plant sugars. And uh, because they're not good digesters, a lot of this uh, is ex excreted out the other end and causes honeydew, uh, six, a, sticky, um, a sticky substance that gets over everything. So we're familiar with this with soft scales and aphids and um, other insect pests that we're, you know, we're all familiar with dealing with, but this is on a level like um, um, no one's really seen before. And so it, it really is uh, when you, when these sugars start fermenting, uh, uh, it, it really does feel like you, you are, you, it, sometimes it smells like a brewery that you're walking by, or um, I always, I always imagine, <clears throat> you know, the sticky floor of a, of a movie theater from all the soda uh, when you're walking down a, um, a sidewalk over, you know, a, a tree that's being um, preyed upon by, by a lot of a lanternfly or, or aphids in some cases. So, um, and, and this goes on from July, sort of when the adults emerged from the earlier instars through September, you know, this year it was uh, well in October that we were continuing to confront these these populations. And because of that, you know, unlike lanternfly, this has become in our area a big deal. Everyone talks about it. Everyone, I, my dad actually lives down in near the ground zero area of Berks County. And um, when we talk on the phone, it was always the first thing was about sort of the, the kill count. Yeah, my you know, uh, mom and I were out there and we killed, uh, we must've killed 400 lanternfly today. Or we've gone, or we've gone through, you know, three uh, fly swatters to this point. So it really creates an opportunity to work with the public uh, and engage with them and allow them to, and, and help them understand and, and work through this because it, it's, uh, it's become quite a, um, uh, a process. And uh, like I said, it's, uh, it's it's still regional. It's still mostly for us, but uh, it, it's good chance that you know this will continue to spread into to other areas. So we want to consider factors for determining the appropriate uh, management strategies. This is a cool shot because it, it's a moment where we have uh, the two earlier instars, the black form and the red form, as well as the adult. You could see an adult there in the center. So this would have been sometime probably 
mid to late July uh, when you had that transitioning happening. Uh, so what we need to realize uh, though, again, and we can always compare it to Emerald Ash Borer, this is not a one solution type of problem. Uh, ash trees, we, we have just had great uh, uh, products that, you know, really just, um, you could practically guarantee it. The success rate has been so high and, uh, and the, um, you know, we come in, oh, you have an ash tree. Well, we're going to treat that and, and we have a great solution for that. We'll be back in two or maybe three years and we'll do it again. And it, it, without problem, you, you go back and the tree's fine and you, you continue to treat it. It's been a great, great opportunity for arborists. Uh, with lanternfly, we, we can offer solutions, um, but they're still going to keep coming. Um, a solution isn't the eradication of this past. And, and, and early on in this, um, I struggled as a sales arborist to uh, get, get to the sale, right? It was so easy to, to devolve into feeling like an extension agent. And I'd go out on properties and I'd tell all about the problem. Sometimes we'd spend up to an hour just talking about, well, we can do this or we can do that, and, but it's not actually going to do what you might think it's going to do. And it's probably you know, and things like, well, what about my, my, if my neighbor doesn't treat his tree, how is that going to impact me? Or, you know, why should I do anything? And, and then you'd get to this point where you would feel paralyzed to even make any difference. And you, you would have spent, you know, as a, as a, you know, an arborist, you're, you're, you're working and that, that hour was great for educating somebody else. Uh, but, but it wasn't, it wasn't making the sale and it wasn't, um, doing anything to solve this problem or work towards solving it. So I think my recommendation is, as, as uh, you as uh, commercial arborists confront it, to set the expectations, but move quickly into, hey, and this is how we can help you um, and, and, and stick with it. Or if you don't see that there is a solution, you know, let them know that quickly and move on, maybe leave them some literature from, from a university or something. So factors to consider. And so, so you're going out to a property. Um, do they have ailanthus trees on their property? So now we we have an understanding that maybe, uh, you know, ailanthus isn't the, the the complete ticket here. Uh, that even without ailanthus, spotted lanternfly will continue to be a problem. But uh, that having said, that ailanthus trees, of course, aren't if ever uh, a valuable landscape tree, or you know, usually it's something that had invaded an area that had been disturbed or it was off to the, to the side of the property, somewhere that was let go. So uh, removing an ailanthus tree or uh, treating it with a systemic insecticide are both really great ways to, probably the number one way to uh, help the lanternfly situation. Um, think of treating an ailanthus tree as having, setting up a, um, a Japanese beetle bag, those, those traps that homeowners get because they're being drawn to it. So often it's nice to have that, that focal point to attract them. Uh, if not, because that's what we find that these lanternfly will just be walking around all over your property and, and uh, you, you don't have as, as a uh, concentrated way to, to, to work with it. So to have something like that could be at least a short-term opportunity. I've had some instances where I've treated uh, you know, it has to do with our, our backlog as well, but we'll treat the tree now, we'll kill a bunch of bugs, and then we're, we're going to come back in the winter, we're going to take the tree down. Uh, so that can be sort of a, that's a, a pretty quick solution. Um, do they have other susceptible trees and shrubs on the property? And, and uh, are those trees desirable or not? So in our area, uh, silver maple is often a volunteer uh, tree that grows up, um, you know, the seeds spread, spread widely and often not, you know, sometimes our silver maples are, are considered nice landscape trees, but in some cases they're not. If it's, a, if it's one that's overhanging a driveway uh, and the sooty mold and with a honeydew and the resulting sooty mold is a problem, that would be, that could be an option. Maybe we'll just take this tree down, you know, let's look at it from an IPM approach. Uh, long term, we don't really know what this pest is going to do, but long term we could, um, replace it with a tree that's not going to be uh, host to lanternfly. 
And then we'd want to look at prioritizing services because you could throw the kitchen sink at this problem on any given property and it could get super expensive uh, and still the outcomes would be noticeable, but maybe not, you know, we're not, again, we're not eradicating this past. Uh, they're still going to see it and you're going to get callbacks. So you, you, you don't want to oversell, overpromise, and or definitely don't guarantee, uh, but, but to say, hey, we are, we are helping this and we are reducing, uh, in the case of using insecticides, we are reducing the, the pest pressure and therefore the stress in that, that tree that's being treated. Uh, an example of prioritizing services would be to treat, focus on trees that overhang driveways, sidewalks, houses, decks, uh, and leave the ones that are out um, in the backyard, out of the way, you know, not where the kids play. Um, leave those, leave those go for now, uh, because, like I say, there's going to be limits to what we can achieve in this this work. It brings us to the idea that there's a, because of this, this is such an obvious problem, uh, homeowners and uh, non arborists are going out there and doing everything they can, everything they find uh, to attack it. And so it's important for us as uh, professionals in this industry to, and the, just because we tell them, oh, we'll take care of it and they won't have to, they're still out there doing it. So we, while we're, uh, providing service, we want to give uh, customers uh, opportunities and uh, sound advice on what they can do, because they're obviously going to be, they're there every day, they're, they're confronting it. Uh, the number one thing is, you know, during the season, smacking them down, stomping on them, uh, every chance you get, that really does, you know, it does something if it doesn't, if it isn't just for uh, someone's uh, um, feeling like they're doing something. We've actually just developed, we just put, these, put our name on a fly swatter uh, because uh, you know, it's, a, it's a great marketing opportunity and uh, something you, you can leave behind and, uh, and they can remember you by that. Uh, and like I say, um, you, can, you can kill a lot of bugs uh, pretty quick. They're surprisingly fast, but uh, um, you get the hang of it. Outside of the, the, uh, the you know, during the overwintering months, so from, uh, you know, they start laying eggs uh, August, September, October, uh, at that time, be coming through and, and scraping these egg masses off these smooth surfaces. Uh, they don't often uh, even put them on the Alanthus tree, you know, their primary host. They're often, we'll often find them a lot of time on red maples, uh, black birch in our area. We've seen, I've seen a lot, um, but they don't even have to be on a tree. They could be on picnic tables, uh, uh, travel trailers, um, any any smooth surface, metal, sides of houses. And so uh, scraping these egg masses is an effective way of reducing the population. Uh, they say uh, each, each of these mud streaks uh, can have up to 50 uh, eggs within them. So uh, you can do a lot of um, work um, to, to, to suppress the population. Is it really making a difference? You know, the best we can do, all of these efforts, uh, similar to what we're facing with the pandemic, the pandemic is trying to flatten the curve. Um, we we want to give, before it gets completely widespread, we want to give researchers and scientists and entomologists opportunities to, to really figure this problem out with the, with the idea that hopefully there'll be some biocontrols and parasites that, that can maybe do, do a, a greater job at uh, getting this under control than what we can do on the landscape level. And uh, what, what I often will tell customers every chance I get is, you know, uh, there's, there's a few things that are happening in our area uh, that have negative consequences. Uh, so I, I tell people don't overuse sticky bands. The place for sticky bands is on the, the outer margin of an infestation so that landscape um, um, service providers can know once th that, that there's a pest issue present and then that, that time they can act. Uh, what, what, what tends to happen is that people buy these sticky bands in bulk or, or, uh, or their landscape contractor will buy them in bulk and provide the service where they're going to constantly come out and, and put new sticky bands on. That picture there is a really, wow, an effective job at, at getting those early instars. But what we typically see is a few lanternfly and a lot of other bycatch, a lot of other uh, types of insects and spiders 
And unfortunately, mammals from squirrels, flying squirrels, um, bats, birds, uh, and, it, and it becomes quite gruesome uh, and not the, not the prettiest thing to have out on the front yard. You know, we'll, we'll drive by areas where, you know, several trees, they all have these bands and this, this death scene. Uh, so, and in the scheme of things, it's probably really not doing that great of a control. Again, it's, uh, it's, it's makes, make, maybe makes somebody feel good about something, but like I say, there's got to be better ways to, to address it. <laughs> now, I, having said that, there are modified sticky bands that have uh, measures that prevent mammals and birds from, from getting getting on there. So if, if you did something like that, or somebody did something like that, yeah, that would be the way to go. We also want to avoid using off the shelf insecticides. I feel, you know, this is anecdotally, I don't have evidence to support it, but from my travels and my talking to a lot of people, people are really flocking to off the shelf insecticides, whether it be systemics or contact sprays, and they're just dousing the environment uh, with, the, with the, they want to stop this infestation. Um, and the, a lot of the systemics that, that homeowners can have access to aren't labeled for lanternfly, and at, the, at, at, at best, they're not probably very effective at controlling lanternfly. Uh, same with the spray. If someone's going to spray something like seven, uh, they really need to have a good handle on the label uh, and, and how it's used, how often it should be used, what's the concentration, uh, things like that. Because you, know, you hear these stories about, well, I sprayed it with seven and the thing just kept walking. So I sprayed it again and I sprayed it again. You know, so they're like unloading a tank on you know, several lanternfly. And obviously it takes a little bit of time for, for a, 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 a big, bug like that to to die so um, we're just using too much insecticide so those are those are recommendations that i i i give every chance i i can get so it brings us to uh, implementation of control methods uh, using rainbow solutions to serve customers rainbow for us uh, for our company goods um, has been super helpful you know well before Blanner fly you know they've just uh, really been able to help us with uh, developing our plan health care programming and solutions and uh, and and of course with the product line and so rainbow got out a, uh, got out ahead of this early and uh, transtech was um, we had they had an emergency uh, label developed uh, for specifically for lanternfly and, and uh, the depart our uh, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture uh, was able to use this in their arsenal to to get ahead in uh, the early work on this. So um, the, the water soluble packets, you know, backpack sprayer. Uh, so it's it's low tech. You don't need a lot of you know besides a, a, a hand pump or a backpack sprayer to to administer it. Fast uptake, and uh, um, we don't have to worry. We're not spraying whole canopy, so very direct uh, effort for a systemic application, and the, the results have been very effective, um, and and continues to be our main um, tool in the kit for addressing this. We haven't, as of yet, but I see this year uh, we plan on on using the Transtech infusible. Um, I have concerns with the uh, doing trunk sprays on large exfoliating kinds of trees, silver maples, uh, river birches, uh, that we're not getting enough of, a, of, a, of the, um, we'll let Patrick talk more about this, but that a lot of that material is just not getting into the tree. And so uh, a uh, trunk injection with the infusible dinotephrin um, could I, I do see that as being a, a good opportunity for us. It also, so when we're using trunk sprays, there are per acre limitations uh, uh, out there that we just can't apply, you know, more than so much uh, per acre. And so we, we can, that's a, using an infusible is a, is a good workaround for, for that. And like I said, corky and exfoliating bark. So think of a willow, an older willow, you can have, you know, the, the bark, maybe two inches uh, deep and furrowed. And, and so just concern that, that we're not getting enough uh, material in it with the trunk spray. So we look forward to uh, seeing how that works for us. 
this you may or, or may not have seen, but this has become a, a help to us. This was a, put out by Penn State Extension Service a couple of years ago, and it looked at the feeding behavior and time frame of the pest um, through the season. So early on, you know, those, those black and white inst early instars are, are on grape. Um, we have a lot of uh, wild grape that tends to be an invasive uh, plant for us, uh, but thinking about cultivated multifloral rows. So when we have a plant healthcare program, our technicians will, will are, and now as the spotted lanternfly is moving into our area, can focus on roses, taking a look and, and doing some contact uh, knockdown sprays uh, to, to help control that early on. And then also, as we look through this tree of heaven, you know, they're really um, host that provides a, a food source throughout their, their whole life cycle. Black walnut, um, which early on was considered to be a, uh, a, you know, probably like the second best, you know, it seemed like that was that was the idea. They it's it's they don't feed on it as adults. It's more of an early instar thing. So um, this year we're we're going to really be careful. You know, so Schranstek has a, a ninety day efficacy period, uh, and you, and and I'm pretty sure we probably shouldn't be spraying it, using it more than once in the season. So we really want to nail the timing. So we'll be concentrating our our trunk sprays on black walnut. We don't have many butternut in our area. Um, early. So we would be hitting it uh, mid to late May so that we have, so it's there while they're feeding June, July, uh, and then by come later in the season, we don't have to worry so much about it. Uh, river birch, willow sumac. I don't intend to treat any sumac, but there are some nice uh, cultivars of sumac sort of a, in the landscape, but more of a, a low level ground cover plant that uh, I haven't quite, I haven't seen that be a problem, but if, if it were, you know, I would imagine doing a, just a contact spray, you know, it's something to put in our scouting routine and, um, and then focusing and not applying Transtech to our maple. So, uh, somehow, so silver and reds really take the brunt of it late season, um, sugars, sugar maples, Norway maples, Japanese maples, uh, they, they, the lanternfly don't show any interest in them, but silvers and reds really take a take a beating. Same with the uh, the Armstrong maples, um, and so uh, but it comes late, so it's important to withhold back, you know, until till later on, you know, late July at, at the earliest, but e even waiting into August to to get that spray on because they will continue to be there. Like I say, this year it was into October that we were uh, dealing with that. Pitfalls to avoid when adding the service to your platform. Um, we've we've encountered a few of them, and so I just want to share some of that experience with you here. Um, I've mentioned this a few times already. It's all about tempering customer expectations. Uh, we're not going to completely make this problem go away. Uh, even with trees that are treated, um, you're going to be dealing with it. And so um, the, the key is to, to sell them on that this is good for your tree, it, you know, not only are we killing these bugs, these lanternfly, uh, we are also reducing the, the pest pressure and the amount of feeding that's going on. So there, there is a, a health, tree health benefit to having us treat key trees in the landscape. Um, now, a, a big one that we've uh, really facing now that lanternfly has moved into our area, uh, we have a lot of existing plant healthcare programs for uh, both commercial, institutional, and residential customers. And so we, we send our, we're sending our renewal proposals out for this 2021 season. And it's not easy to incorporate spotted lanternfly management into the program. One, it's not the first year, so a couple of years ago, we started putting a disclaimer note this on each line item, you know, so may visit this, this, this note, this program does not uh, include spotted lanternfly management or suppression. Well, that sort of gave us, a, there was a lot of pushback on that. Uh, well, why not? That's what I have you hired for. And um, it makes sense. So this year now we are uh, doing a, our, our, um, working hard to incorporate it into the program. People expect this of us. Our customers expect us 
you know, they've been paying us to take care of their landscape. Spotted lanternfly at this point is now just another one of these threats to the landscape. And so we're looking at um, a, a combination, well, taking a real integrated pest management approach. So we're getting out on these properties, making sure there aren't any lanthus trees, or uh, if it's a homeowners association, a lanthus trees at the perimeter. Uh, and we're going to focus on target applications of uh, systemic insecticides uh, to key plants, uh, and as well as uh, probably some knockdown sprays of contact insecticide when we are on properties. Because um, although the systemics work well, it doesn't happen uh, in an instant. So they slow the feeding. Uh, it's as if they become drunk on the, the pesticide and they just sort of hang out. And, they, and so people are you know, they question, well, I don't know that it's working well. If, if you could see it the other way, if, if you weren't doing anything, you would see a difference. Uh, and then over time, they, uh, in that image on the uh, uh, spring, they, they tend to flare their wings out and that's sort of their final gasp. And then often they'll either just stay clung to the tree or they'll fall off. But having a, uh, an extra dose uh, of a contact spray you know, very selective, uh, just focusing right on the pest uh, can be helpful. So August, September, and in October um, can be helpful just to get a little bit more control and, and reduce those numbers because they are mating. So by killing uh, gravid female or, or when they're in the process of mating, we are gonna reduce the, the number of eggs that are gonna be um, laid everywhere uh, during that time. And forecasting the future of the pest. This, this one has also been a pitfall. I have, uh, I have a customer and a big weeping willow in the back of the property, important tree for them, right? And so I said, well, we're gonna to wanna to treat that tree, this, this was last year, with a systemic insecticide, Transdec, uh, to suppress this pest. And you know, obviously there's a, an additional cost. It's not just their plant health care program. Now we're doing this target application. And so uh, I go out uh, this last summer, it was July, it was August, and no lantern fly in sight. And the questions start coming, well, I spent all this money on this treatment and it doesn't seem like they're not even bothering it. Well, so I just say this as a cautionary tale that we don't always know because of its uh, invasive nature, it's not, it's not normalized. It doesn't have these behaviors we can expect to see like many of our other pests like a Japanese beetle or a bagworm, it, it, it still has some fluidity to it. And so um, that's where we wanna be careful when we're uh, proposing work with the expectation of it being there that, um, that we're pretty certain of that or, or, or use language that uh, allows uh, you know, negotiation as that time comes. Uh, otherwise, it can leave uh, customers feeling like uh, we didn't know what we were doing. Another thing, uh, so I mentioned my dad lives down near Ground Zero there, and he had three years of really bad lanternfly uh, infestations. And then, this would have been two years ago, nothing, hardly a, a bug on his property. And so uh, it just, we're, everybody, the, you know, the researchers are, are still trying to figure this out. Uh, certainly, and then this last year they were back. So uh, it's it's not an easy one to to manage from that perspective. Uh, the, and a final word on that is um, not so much in plant healthcare of residential and commercial properties, but thinking about spot lantern fly contracting work for entities like the USDA or in our case the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture or other um, entities that are responsible for large areas. The railroad would be another um, example. When you think about where Atlantis grows, it's, it's never, it tends to be one of the worst places, right? You know, it's along the railroad tracks, it's, it's, a, it's next to a dump or, um, you know, it could be a, whatever that is, a landfill, you know, there's poison ivy there, there's snakes, there's ticks. It's just, and it's thick, it's full, there's briars, there's thickets. And it's not work for the faint of heart uh, to come to work every day and go out and do that work uh, is takes takes dedication and it takes uh, um, real 
focus on getting the job done properly. You can't just send anybody out there and expect it to be done well, or you'll be going back to, to fix mistakes. So uh, recruiting qualified labor uh, that, that have uh, energy and commitment uh, is, is, is key. So um, we had experiences with that where it was hard to, we really wanted to maximize our, our work with uh, contracting with uh, uh, the PDA, uh, but we were limited by having qualified people to do it. Uh, the other qualification I didn't mention earlier is that uh, for that work, we needed uh, licensed pesticide applicators. So in, in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, besides having core, the safety component, they also needed uh, category six, which is ornamental trees and shrubs, uh, and category 10, which is right of way work. So that would be uh, for applying the um, non-selective herbicides. Um, so all of that really, you know, when you're thinking about if, if taking on this type of work uh, is, is uh, something you're looking to do, getting out ahead of that and really setting the, the, the framework, because once you, you have these contracts, you have a commitment to act and you wanna make sure that you're ready to, ready to roll right away to, to get you the, the best um, foot forward. And I'll just leave you with a quick case study. Uh, you know, this is this is a pretty typical situation for us. Where in our area we have a lot of uh, newer developments, and obviously red maple is uh, tends to be a, one of the most common uh, trees being grown uh, in the landscape. So here's you know there's a couple hundred homes, and they all have a red maple in front of their house. We get a call from one person who lives in one of those houses and saying, "Hey, I have these lanternfly all over my tree." Uh, so you go out and this is sort of that, that problem where you uh, doing all sorts of educating of the customer, but maybe not being able to, to provide a clear solution. Yeah, we could treat that tree with the insecticide. Uh, is that going to be enough for that, that individual? A better way in that, that situation is, is to get involved, uh, do, work directly with the management company who who works with the HOA or the HOA board specifically, uh, develop a relationship, uh, gain that trust and uh, come up with a, a more holistic solution. Uh, on this image, you can see on the bottom, there's some, some um, uh, naturalized lands, probably a good chance that there's invasive Atlantis, grapevine, other uh, host species that could be a reservoir for lanternfly other than the landscape trees on these people's property. So working from that angle, as well as in the landscape on the people's property is, is definitely something to consider. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, expanding our service with the uh, Transtech infusible because of, uh, you know, it, it's just, it wouldn't be realistic, yet alone legal to, to spray all of those trees with um, a trunk spray. Um, so this allows us another tool in the kit to be able to, uh, to, to uh, have um, reasonable results for our customers. Again, prioritizing trees that are, are gonna, you know, with the, with the honeydew coming down um, areas over roads, sidewalks, driveways and decks and, and that kind of thing. So um, we, we've learned a lot and I anticipate 2021 will be no different. There's, a, there's a, so much more to learn about this and, and we look forward to doing so. I'll open that up to questions then. Thank you, Patrick. We are joined today with John Schock. Oh, excuse uh, me, everybody. There we go. Well, that was great. Um, that was phenomenal. So if you bear with me here, I just want to show everybody before we do take some questions from John, except for, of course, I am struggling with my technology here, but very quickly, uh, just to kind of go over the high level what John covered over with us on the um, kind of management approach, if you will. So, um, you know, at Rainbow here, we look at a toolbox approach to managing all of our insects out there. And so, you know, John covered over on this, you know, talking about the time of year, the, the instar or the adult, uh, and then the plants that they uh, cover over on. So we have several options here, um, you know, for these early instars on these plants that are really sensitive, um, or not so sensitive, for your clients that are sensitive, you know, these contact sprays um, right now by Fenthern is probably about the best choice. 
Um, but then as we get into the more woody plants, looking at um, Transtech, which is Dinotectoran as a systemic option. And then John touched on it, and we won't spend too much time here because I want to make sure we get questions, but we also have our trunk injected product, Transtech Infusible, which is also Dinotectoran. And as John mentioned in his um, great talk there, you know, this would be an option for trees in sensitive areas or um, you know, where you're getting in these large areas where you're, you're not wanting to put out that much active ingredient into the, into the environment. So I'll hold off on showing all of the data because we do have another talk coming up here on the latest research. But with that, um, John, if we wanna take some questions, I have some here for you that I can just go ahead and read. Sure. And uh, we'll have a we'll have a, a hard stop here at one o'clock. Um, but the one is the first question here is, um, you know, are there any natural enemies of spot and lanternfly um, out there in the landscape right now? Yeah, so anecdotally, you do see uh, some things that will feed on them. Uh, praying mantis, you, somebody will always post a picture on Facebook about, oh, look at this, they're going for it. Um, but but. For the most part, there's not any, not enough to to make a difference, is my understanding. Right on. Um, here's a really interesting question here too. So, John, when removing such a high number of Atlantis in an area, do you ever see issues where spot and lanternfly begins to infest surrounding species, such as maple or other high value species, um, rather than going to those trap trees that are left out there? Right. So, the, the, it could be a concern that if you're if you're depleting a food source in a specific area where they are, that you are forcing them to move move on and, and out uh, and also into other in people's landscapes into more preferred trees. Um, but that's happening anyway, right? So as the pest pressure, there's so many of them. And so it's just natural for them to continue to, 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 to move outward. So I, I don't think, uh, and the way that we've experienced so far, they treat enough trap trees with insecticide within those, well, it's on those, on those properties that uh, it seems like it, it's a pretty effective or it has been an effective strategy. Excellent, thanks. Uh, there's a question here, and you may have mentioned this in the presentation, and even I may have missed it, but um, are they considered strong flyers? Do they move far, the adults? Uh, you, you see um, both sides. People say that they're not strong flyers. Well, relative to what? A, an eagle, right? No, no, so they're not. They typically will hop. They, they walk up the tree, but they'll off. You, you will see them. You, you could see them moving across you know, a, a lawn. Uh, and, and, and in the, in the end, towards the end of the year, and this is, again, I'm not a, a lanternfly researcher, but uh, it seems that they really take almost like a, like a swarm where they'll, they'll head up into and you know, catch wind currents and, and move uh, longer distances is, is the way I've seen it uh, in, uh, in our area, some of our natural areas or in, in, in where I live. Um, I, there's no other good justification to see how they've gotten into some of these, you know, in the middle of a, you know, there, there was a lanthus there, so it has been disturbed, but that there was, there was no good explanation other than that they had uh, flown considerable distances. Right on. Um, another one here. So you mentioned egg mass scraping. Is there like a disposal protocol if you were there Scraping are, it. and I, I would consult, you know, uh, so Penn State University of the Extension Service has uh, really good information on that, and they, they include um, scraping and, and into a, you know, a, a jar that has maybe an alcohol solution to make sure you kill them, but when I'm out hiking with my kids or, or um, just out anywhere, and I see them, I take a stick and I just scrape them off. My, my thinking is that that's, that's going a, a long way uh, at, at I, I can't imagine that they can survive once they, you know, especially this time of year or earlier that they're going to be able to continue to survive. But, but, but evidently they, they, they can, because I don't know why else they would be doing all those other extra measures. That makes sense. Um, and then we only have time for a few more questions. So for everybody out there, if we don't get your questions, we will take note of them and we will get back to you uh, by the end of the week is, is what I'm saying right now. Um, but so there's a couple questions here about um, chemical applications that can penetrate the egg masses and then also the use of dormant oils. So um, is there any value in using dormant oils? Uh, would those I, penetrate I, the egg masses or is there anything else out there that you guys? I've definitely heard, heard of, uh, that question asked and from what I've heard uh, 
the researchers say is that that isn't effective uh, strategy and also it would take quite a bit to, to, to be effective. Uh, the thinking in dormant oil, um, the other part of that was, uh, what was the other part of that? Um, is there any chemicals that you know that would penetrate those? Oh, and that? right, so like an oversight. No, I, that hasn't been an effective area for consideration. I don't, I, I don't not to my knowledge. Gotcha, excellent. Let's see here if I can dig up. There's uh, several really great questions in here. Uh, so again, everyone, thanks for participating in this. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to get and find ones that would be perfect for, for John to answer. And actually right now we are at indeed time. So um, John, we'll let you go from here. Everybody, again, thank you so much for your attendance. John, that was a great presentation. Really appreciate your uh, participation. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to, to Rainbow, to John, your territory manager, our tech support line. Um, and with that, we will conclude. Everybody have a great afternoon and we will see you next time. Thanks, Thanks everybody.